I'm very happy to be able to, to get you here today for a special masterclass presentation de for Monsieur Maître Yu Suzuki. Master Il a évidemment Suzuki. bercé nos cœurs avec euh, of différentes course, productions he, de jeux vidéo. Uh, uh, was always in our hearts with the productions of video games, creations, new creations always going towards new technologies. I think that the best thing to present him is to see this introductory video. Well, I think we can see really the length, the, the breadth of this uh, of this work over over 30 years of a career. So, of course, we, we are able to we have the, the pleasure of having him here today. Are you are you ready? Are you sure? I want to hear more. All right, let's greet him, Mr. Yu Suzuki. Thank you, sir. He is accompanied by Florent Gorge. Florent is a very famous man in this uh, Japanese world here. And so he's going to take the lead on this presentation. There we go. Finally. Thank you all for coming. So numerous tonight. Like Idir told us, we are so honored to have Mr. Suzuki here. We have one hour, including translation. We're not going to talk about everything. So in advance, we're sorry, but we have, we prepared this to try to put as many funny anecdotes as possible. We won't be able to talk about everything. But of course, you'll have anecdotes about his career, his childhood, also Shenmue, and a couple novelties on Shenmue 3. So we're going to start right now. When you were a child, what kind of a kid were you? What kind of uh, games did you play? I played Lego a lot. I loved to build cars, spaceships, things that, that were pretty imposing. And I liked to build things that looked like me, that were in my image. Yeah. 
こう丸い団子を作ってそれでこう落として友達とどっちが先に壊れるかっていう競争してる。And since I, built, I, I lived really in the middle of nowhere, we had to invent our own games. With my friends, we had this game where we would get dirt, we'd make balls out of it, and we would let go at the same height, and whoever's ball lasted the longest won. I was pretty good at that game because I had techniques to make the dirt stronger. I'd go heat it up, I'd go get clay, especially in places where I knew that the dirt was,、uh, was harder. I was very good at that game. But I also think that you were a fan of models. Can you tell us about that passion? When I was a child, I would regularly have、uh, be bought、uh, models, boxes with models. I would never build what was in the instruction. So, when I opened up the box, I would detach all the pieces, put it in one big box, and then would build things that you know, looked like me. I didn't want to do what people asked me to do. So, I imagine it must have、uh, surprised your parents. So he realized that he really liked to add things according to his own taste, like pretty powerful motors. And I like to build cars with、uh, these models. ペイントして飾るじゃないですか。で、僕がそういうことしないので、あの怒ってましたね。My parents thought it was pretty strange because, in their mind, when you bought a box set, you opened up the box, you did exactly what the instructions asked, you painted it, and then you used it to decorate your room, your bedroom. And so they got pretty, they'd, they'd get annoyed, they'd get mad. They said, build the model and then put it in your bedroom. So once I built exactly as it was instructed, and then as soon as they saw it, they were happy, I broke, I destroyed it, the whole thing, and put it in my box where I had all the pieces. So I think your parents were musicians, they were、uh, music teachers. Did it have an influence on you? Yes, my parents were both、uh, teachers in a primary school. My mother was also a piano teacher. She tried to teach me how to play piano and forced me to listen to classical music, but I was a pretty rebellious child at the time. I hated listening to piano and classical music. I wanted to do rock and roll. And actually, I wanted to play electric guitar, but all I had was a classical guitar. So I created my own electric guitar by putting it through an amp. So your parents didn't want to buy you an electric guitar? No, my parents were against. At that time in Japan,、um, there was an image, a, a very negative image of the electric guitar. 
uh, electric guitar meant that you were uh, a, a punk and I had that's why I had to do it myself so when you were younger what what uh, job did you want to do so when I was a kid, I already realized that working wasn't great and I wanted to find a job that would give me um, as much time as possible for my passions. That was my priority. What kind of job can I find to have as much free time as possible? <laughs> so when I was a kid, I thought, well, what about not becoming a teacher? Because there, there's a lot of vacation in summer, in, uh, in winter. It allowed me to do nothing. It was great. Then I wanted to be a dentist. Because it's an independent job, so you can uh, pick your own vacation. You can put, uh, take days whenever you want. So I thought, if I'm going to have a job, I might as well have one where I can choose when I can rest. And in the end, I went into Sega and I chose them because they guaranteed two days off a week. So these were jobs that had nothing to do with programming. Yes, so I, I, I asked him, why did you choose programmer? And he said, because I lived in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the countryside, all the names that had a name, all the jobs with a name in English sounded really cool, like illustrator. Through my ear, since I lived in the middle of the countryside, it sounded really good. So I went towards programmer because there was, um, <laughs> I was wrong in my mind. I thought pro, you know, I knew that meant professional and grammar, grammar. I thought it sounded like love. So I thought, it's, it must be something like sexy women. So if I become a pro in love, then I should have, you know, it should be pretty cool. <laughs> what an anecdote. So you must have been disappointed when you actually became a programmer. So, Mr. Suzuki went into Sega and he developed a large number of games that became huge hate hits like Hangun, like Outrun, Space Run, Afterburner. And when you think about it, when you think about all this, during all these Sega years, there's something in common with, with it in all these games. There's, you know, like really his, his, his style. We can recognize it. And so for you, what is this special Suzuki type? Uh, 
So maybe the common element is just that when I start uh, um, developing a game, I really go very far into research. Not just a little bit. I, I really go, I, I research as much as possible. So, for example, when I wanted to go into a racing game, I started doing research, you know, in-depth research about uh, aerodynamics, how um, tires worked, what types of tires are used in different races. When I looked into Ferrari, I wanted to know you know how how much the you know the black horse would would raise up i i i went really far so for example for the game afterburner I did a lot of research on aviation, types like uh, planes like Mirage, uh, how many um, how many missiles they could carry, how many miles they needed to turn around, their max speed. Anytime I went into a new field for a game, I really became kind of a specialist in that field. So maybe that's my special Suzuki touch that people talk about it today. So instead of doing research on what already exists, other games, I would really do research on reality. And as much as possible, I would go in a car and go on the circuit or go on a motorcycle. I would really be able to get the, the essence of that activity that was a passion and to put it as, as much as I could into a game. So we have a small video from a, a developer. We have a surprise, a question by a developer. Hi, I'm Steve Lysa from Sumo Digital. Uh, as you may know, we're big fans of Yu Suzuki's work. Uh, not least, hi, I'm Steve Lysa from Sumo Digital. Uh, as you may know, we're big fans of Yu Suzuki's work. Uh, not least of Yu Suzuki's racing and outrun cabinets, the Space Alien cab, and the Super Hang On bike uh, within All Star Racing Transform. I'd also personally like to thank Yu Suzuki for kickstarting Shenmue 3, which was an idea that kind of floated on the internet a while back. But today I have a special question. Uh, isn't it time we had a new version of Space Harrier? Space Harrier, that's the one who plays with me. And the majority is very happy for a Space Harrier. Yes, yes. So, if you want to know what you want to know, Space Harrier is a new one that you want to play with the people in the world, but do you have a chance to see Space Harrier in the future? Do we have a chance of seeing Space Harrier again one day? Yes, yes. 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 Yeah, oh, I'd really like to. Why not one day uh, make another Space Harrier? And, and I can't really talk about it, but I have projects here and there, and it would be pretty good um, to use a game like this. Uh, a bit of a teasing. So someone, of course, would love that. Space here, Harrier in VR. So we were talking about Outrun a little bit earlier. We, we quoted it. So you told several times that you wanted to uh, look at the movie Cannonball and use that as an inspiration, you know, that um, going from east to west in the, in the States. And in the end, you were looking towards Europe, towards a trip in Europe. Do you have stories from that uh, trip, a big trip that, uh, that took him throughout Europe? 
そうですねあのフランスに来た時に南フランスの方だったと思うんですけどあのなんか取材の旅行2週間だったんですけどやっぱりお腹が減るじゃないですか。So I came two weeks in Europe indeed and I have one memory it was in the south of France and when we travel a lot we're hungry So I ended up in a restaurant and I asked the waiter, can you bring me a menu? And he didn't bring me a card, he just bring me all the different, um, all the different uh, uh, foods, one after another. And it happened again in different restaurants where he would, they would bring the plates out one at a time and show me everything. So apparently I understood later on that I wasn't really asking menu since uh, the menu since I don't uh, speak uh, French. I would just ask for the daily, uh, the daily. So every time they would bring whatever they had as a daily special. In, in the end, I learned that you should ask for the menu, the card. It was easier to choose your uh, choose your meal. I was really happy. Next time I asked him, um, and he indeed brought me the card, the menu. I was really happy. I, was, I finally got it. But in the, the problem was I couldn't understand anything. So I took four uh, meals uh, at random. I ended up with four soups, and that was my dinner, like an old man eating soup. So I thought, I'm finally, I finally got the right skill. I'm going to take one, something from this part of the menu, this part of the menu, this part, this part, and that should work out. So since I didn't speak French, that taught me anyway how to, you know, get around the difficulties and manage. The, was it good? So in Japan, when we uh, ask for a soup, when we ask for something, they bring you just that. It's, it's small. Whereas here, they bring you a full meal. So a second ago, we were talking about uh, Outrun. And that uh, anecdote came from there, because when we talk about Suzuki and racing games, we also think about uh, virtual racing. Are there any virtual racing fans here? Yeah. So there are other fans, not just here, and among those fans, there is another one, another special question, but I think he knows him very well. Yusan, it's been a while. This is Suda51 from Grasshopper Manufacturer. Congratulations on the announcements around Shenmue 3. It's coming out very soon. As a player, I'm looking forward to diving into it. My favorite game among all your creations is virtual racing. You could even say that it's a game that changed my life. In fact, the first time I met you was during the development of virtual racing in the AM2 building. Do you remember? One day we were having dinner together and you told me you had no memory of our first meeting. <laughs> but to me, it was by meeting you that I wanted to create video games. And here I am, a video game developer. So I have a small question to ask. If you had the possibility of creating a new racing game, what would it look like? F1 or anything else, it doesn't matter. Once upon a time, you opted for Ferrari. Now, would it be Lamborghini? Or since you're in France, would you choose Renault or Peugeot? In any case, what would your racing game look like? There you go. Goodbye. Thank you to Mr. Suda.
質問になりましたけれども、どんなドライブゲーム、どんなゲームを作るんでしょうか ?Quel genre de jeu vous feriez si vous feriez un What type of game would you make if you did a racing game? Just thinking about it really you know, brings me joy. I love racing games. Well, to start with, I'd have to start researching again to you know, get a lot of joy from playing around with、uh, fast cars. And from there, ideas will probably come. I could maybe, you know, it'd be a good opportunity to go around. I'd love to go to the 24 hours in Le Mans. I've never been able to go, and it would, it's always appealed to me. I'd love to go. No one from Le Mans is here, apparently. Not an easy question. I would maybe do、um, a racing simulation, but during rush hour in a, when there's gridlock. You have to use your GPS. <laughs> It would be a simulation like a rally、uh, online by using data、uh, received by GPS. So I would get all the GPS data in real time of what's going on in, in, on the streets of actual countries. And your goal would be to go from point A to point B as fast as possible with the bumper to bumper and to be able to go as fast as possible to go from those two,、uh, those two points. And what's interesting with this concept is that the streets change all the time. It's very unpredictable because it changes all the time. Every race would be different. You'd have to take different,、uh, different roads every time. You'd have to really think and drive in very different situations depending on the time, depending on the place. Every race would really be different. So, it would really be using the concept differently. I've always used, I've always yeah, made racing games with the, the specificity, the main one of, of going fast and, and of being good. This one, the talent, the main talent, is not necessarily to be good at racing, at driving. It's to be able to figure out the way, the best way to go from point A to point B. So, time is running and we need, to,、uh, we need to keep going. So, maybe it's time to go into Shenmue, maybe? Are you interested in Shenmue? All right, looks like it's time. Okay, we have a short trailer to get back into, the, into things. Peggy says. ロシ、俺は
店を脅して金を巻き上げたり昼から酒を飲んで暴れたり町の人たちは怖がるばかりだ。Thank you. So, the same way as Outrun in its time, you told us a funny story about、uh, your trip when you were preparing it.、Uh, we also heard that you did、uh, a lot of research in China. Do you have、uh, trips?、Uh, do you have anecdotes about your trip in China? China and Hong Kong. バーチャーファイターが結構関係があるのでバーチャーファイターの時の取材とかも含めてちょっとなんか喋ってみていいですかねあいいあいやもう一度問題は des anecdotes que je peux vous raconter qui concernent so the anecdotes are also about virtual fighter because you know that the development of、uh, Shenmue and virtual fighter were you know in intricate they were they were done at the same time And so he'll tell us about that period in general. So, among the first things that I wanted to know and discover were the techniques, the counterattacks from Kung Fu. If I do this type of attack, How do actual、uh, people who do kung fu react and counterattack? So he went to a Shaolin temple to find out. And when you go to the Shaolin temple, you realize that there are many, many, many schools of kung fu that have different. Uh, different takes on things. So you have different dojos with different types of kung fu. So, when I was in front of a teacher, I would ask, if I attack you like this, so I'd show him slowly, how would you react to that、uh, hit? And the thing is, I, I couldn't see any difference between the way they counterattack. Because I was doing it so slow. And my adversary, my opponent, would just move to the side or move back. And they would ask, why do you go so slowly? Because if you go this slow, we don't even need to avoid you. Go as fast as possible, really go for it. We're specialists, We're, we train every day. You're just a, a novice.、Uh, don't worry, you won't be able to touch us. So just go for it. Attack. Otherwise, you'll never see the differences in the different counterattacks. So I started really going for it, going to the absolute the maximum I had. And that's when、uh, kids, students、uh, of that school started you know, gathering around us and looking and thinking I had 
uh, challenged their master. They were, they were sh certain that it was an actual fight between different dojos. Whenever I'd get hit, they were really happy to see that they were the best, they were better than karate, because I was Japanese. <laughs> but since I was really going for it, they, uh, by, by sheer reflex, would, would counterattack. And they wouldn't always stop in time. So I, I had, you know, uh, I was got hit everywhere. Even one of my ribs was uh, broken. And I'm, I'm not going to lie, uh, at the time it really hurt, but now when I think back, it's really a great memory. All those, you know, the, the, everything I had, those were achievements. So I suppose you, you filmed that because it was kind of for a, a documentary. You needed to document everything to uh, use it in the game later on. Yes, we did uh, record everything. We had brought a camera at the time that could film at high frame rate. At the time, it was 100 images per second. That was the speed that we had managed to get. I wanted to film and really decompose uh, every, every hit. So we would ask the teacher to do the different hits, and we realized that we didn't have the whole hit within those 100 images. So when we saw the teacher doing his hit, we, we could see that his um, fist was completely out, but we didn't have the image of the of the arm being all the way out. So we realized that within a fraction of a second, he had already started bringing back his fist. That's when I started thinking that really those Shaolin monks were were incredible. They were really uh, not not ordinary, out of the ordinary. So, when we talk about Shen as well, it's a game that really touched a lot of teachers, uh, all the people who are here. If, if you're here, I suppose it means that Shen impacted you. So, what I'd like to know is, in reality, a lot of games came out at that time, but very few managed to impact people as much. Why does this game, even 20 years after, have such an impact? Why does it still touch uh, uh, players as much? So, when I was much younger, I developed only arcade games. And you know that they're special because within three minutes, you need to propose as much as possible. It's very, it's a condensed experience. In three minutes, you have as many elements as possible to give pleasure to the player. And at that time, really, the way we the way we we did it was we needed one game since we didn't have a lot of time to play one game with a unique theme and to get that focus on that theme. Mm. 
入ってるからたくさんの要素がある場合はみんな浅くなるから多分そういったゲームは絶対失敗するっていうタブーがあったんです。And at that time, it was kind of a taboo to say we're going to do one game with different themes, with the things that have nothing to do with one another. So when we concentrate on only one theme, one thing, we really have a lot of time to develop it. But in a game that, that has a lot of those, all of the different themes are going to be much less developed and much less interesting. That was a taboo at the time. あの、反対したけど、あの、バーチャファイターも作ったし、ドライブゲームも作ったし、飛行機のゲームも作ったから、あの、いろいろなノウハウがもあるし、ライブラリーもあるから、それを使えばテーマが複数あっても、なんかでき
I really integrated an, an incredible number of possibilities in every aspect of the game. The point of Shenmue 3 is to take your time and discover them all. It's a game that really shows itself as you go along, as you discover new aspects. And for me, I really imagine Shenmue 3 as a, as a trip, as a big voyage and kind of an initiation. Uh, unlike many current games, we didn't really put a lot of tutorials because we wanted you to have different options to get to where you want to go. The sensation is going to be different if you have to figure it out and find that your way of getting to the destination. So it really is a game, um, I really want to tell you, it, it's a game that you need to savor over time. If you take your time, not just for, not just race through it, you're really going to appreciate it. It's a game that gives a lot of freedom. So at the time, we are, so we're at a time in development with a lot of testers doing play check. And when we watch them play, there are some uh, some players that know Shenmue, some who don't, some who like Shenmue, some who don't. And we saw that every player has a very different way of playing the game. And clearly, I, I felt this thing is that every player expresses their own personality. So for example, just, just one example on an aspect of the game, the you know, greedy people won't play at all in the same way as other people who are more economical and who plan ahead. Some will think I'm going to get my money you know, in a very hard way by cutting uh, cutting trees. Others will go as fast as possible to get a, um, a fishing pole to get the biggest fish possible, to get uh, money as soon as possible. And then some people will simply go to the casino and think that they're going to earn money or win money more easily. Other people are going to be more physical and they're going to learn every single side of uh, fighting techniques and think that they're going to get money, money by, uh, by fighting and by buying the right uh, equipment. And we have an, uh, a common objective for all the players, but for the moment, in every playtest that we've done with the people who played Shenmue 3, I've never seen the same uh, playthrough twice. It really shows the number of different branches that you have to really make this experience unique and make it... I thought that if I had to sum up Shenmue 3 in just one punchline, it's pretty hard to find. 
punchline I'd use is Shenmue 3 is a mirror of yourself. Wow. Shenmue 3. So unfortunately we're getting towards the end of But I think that Mr. Suzuki brought a couple surprises for you. So there are going to be three things that we're going to show in just a moment. First of all, screenshots that we've never shown before. You'll be the first to see them. Then we're going to show you documents that maybe some people have seen. I think we've shown those before. They date from uh, 1995 and 96 when we were developing the first Shenmue. And the third surprise is a short trailer which is not brand new, but very few people have seen it. We, uh, we used it in very specific occasions. All right, let's go. So tell us about uh, these. So this is Chai, an enemy that we had in Shenmue 1. You know him, of course. We see that he's attacking Ryo and his friends. And since you didn't have a lot of news of Nandi, I thought maybe I'll give you some news. So here he is, a very classy uh, visual of Nandi. This is the market that you'll be able to visit in the very first town. And it's the Panda Market. Kind of a cute name. <laughs> oh, it's a, it's a village that really exists, and it's the center of activity in the this town and in the region. You can see uh, there's going to be an arcade, and there's going to be a lot of activities. You'll be able to exchange some things as well. It really is the hub of activity for this village, and uh, it's got a lot of the charm that you uh, that you have in China. And so you saw an arc. You're in a town that's called Chom. I don't know if that's going to be the name in, in English. So, of course, we'll be able to play all of these. I prepared a certain number of games so that you can take, you know, have a lot of pleasure in here with a lot of mini games. I'm not going to reveal too much, but compared to Fen Shenmue 1, in Shenmue 1 you could play uh, old games, but once you were done with that game, it was finished. Here we went further with the concept, because if you the, the better your scores, you'll be able to get better and better stuff. I won't say any more, and it'll, it'll incite you to play all these different games that we prepared. So Flo, uh, Mr. Yu Suzuki, we're going to go into the middle of uh, the 90s. And look at the document. So you can see a sketch from the mid 
J'ai toujours adoré les Fenwick en fait, hein, faut que je l'avoue. I've always loved Fenwicks. Suivant. I've, I've got to admit. ところから始めるか。あの、リオのタッチを、はい、あの、今どんなリオからスタートするか。うん。あの、this image, this sketch, dates from the time when we would we were still doing graphical research for the aspect that we wanted for Rio. Rio. Um, at the time, he was supposed to be Akira from Virtua Fighter, and in the end, we decided to give him another identity and personality. And so we were wondering what kind of visual appearance should he have? Should he be pretty cool, pretty weak? So this is part of the uh, graphical research we were doing at the time. So I'm hearing that we don't have a lot more time. We have to go a little bit faster. Like six more minutes. Uh, this is a young Rio. So here we can see a little bit of an innocent Rio, the, the shonen Rio. At the time, we wanted Rio to start when he was really young and have him evolve over time to become more and more badass. So this was one of the first sketches when he was young and innocent. We also wondered what would he look like if he was more badass, if he was more of a rebel. And now Rio in the middle of a fight. Rio just walking around in the middle of Yokosuka, the town. We're starting to see the, the final Rio, the one you know. So very clearly, you can see you know, the, the traits from Akira. Those sketches date back from when we were um, working on Shenmue as the Virtua Fighter, um, Virtua Fighter RPG. And this image is important because this is really when we figured out, okay, we have the right Rio. This is the one we want for the game. This is the final Rio, and um, and that's the one we used to to you know really make our mind. All right. Well, to conclude, maybe this conference. Do you have a last message for the uh, couple a hundred people who are here? Uh, who came to listen to you? Of course, there was the, the trailer. It's not very long, so we should watch it before the, the personal message. It was just a fortune. I only said wine was bad for his luck. It was just a fortune. I only said wine was bad for his luck. Wow, very convincing. Where you're going to go next? The rest is up to you. Well, uh, thank you. Um, well, again, you know, same question. Do you have a, a final word? I wanted to thank you all so much because if we can create this Shenmue 3, 
It's thanks to the support of the fans and of backers. Once again, thank you for your support. And then he said thank you in French. A big thank you to you, Suzuki. A great honor to receive you in Paris for the Jap Jap Japan Expo. Just a few months away from the release of Shenmue 3. Um, thank you for the great questions, great translation. And Shenmue 3 is coming out November 19th, 2019, on PlayStation 4 and PC. There will also be a collector's edition that you can uh, pre order right away. And once again, Shenmue 3 is uh, a real passion, is years and years of preparation before, um, before we are able to release it. Thank you.